In 2009 in Richmond, California, a 16-year-old girl was brutally beaten and sexually violated for over two hours. It was a crime that shocked not just a community, but a whole nation, not only due to the levels of violence involved, but also because it was witnessed by at least 20 people and not one of them called the police. This is what happens when a pack mentality sanctions the obscene. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. Just gonna say, in the UK right now, we're having a heat wave. It happens for like 10 days every year, and then just goes back to raining, particularly where I live. But if I sweat throughout this, that's why. Just keeping it real with you all. Also, for those of you coming back, thank you as ever. You know, you are amazing. I adore each and every one of you. For those of you who are new to my channel, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday consistently. Crime and consistency is my catchphrase. And I deep dive, so hopefully, even if you know the cases that I cover, you will take away some facts that you are not quite aware of. Also, just so you know, there's building works going on outside my home. So at times, it might sound as if somebody is coming in like the chainsaw massacre, but it's not. It's just outside my windows. It's too hot to close the windows. Let's go back to the 24th of October, 2009. Richmond, San Francisco Bay, California. Now that evening, Richmond High School were holding its homecoming dance, which is obviously a massive deal in the States. It's a really big thing for teenagers. And one of the students who was attending was a 16-year-old sophomore. Now she's later referred to in reports for reasons of anonymity as Jane Doe, which is perfectly understandable. What happens to her the night that I'm gonna cover is truly abominable. And we have to remember that this is a girl who would likely wish for other people who she meets as she grows up not to know about what she endured, unless she wants them to know. There's absolutely no shame whatsoever. In fact, I would argue psychologically, when something terribly traumatic happens to you and you are a victim, holding back and not speaking and talking about that is actually damaging for you because you did nothing wrong. You're a survivor. So if you talk about the issues that you faced, and somebody struggles with that, well, that's on them. Not every human's great at managing those kind of pieces of information, but it's not on you. And I often, in my therapeutic work with people, talk about owning that situation and being able to actively talk about it. But that's when it's on your terms and your choice to the people that you want to tell. Whereas if you imagine being 16 and suddenly your face being all over the papers, talking about some of the most appalling things happening to you, and then deciding that you want to be a lawyer five years down the line and constantly being paranoid that somebody's going to know that that was you, I completely agree and understand why anonymity is so powerfully important in these cases. The same with any sexual violation cases. It's such a personal experience and you should be the one in control of discussing that or you can feel violated again. Now, understandably, this girl, she'd been really looking forward to the event and Clearly the family were close. Her dad had been out and bought her this sparkly lavender dress to wear. She got these silver shoes. She got a diamond necklace. So I think all of us can look back at being 16 years of age and those events where it felt like you were going to get treated a little bit like an adult. You could dress up, hang out with people that you liked. It's super exciting because there's not a lot going on in your life apart from education and socialization when you're that age you've not got bills to pay for example so you can truly engage in the excitement of those events and i think that in america they've always gone above and beyond when it comes down to these kind of events in the uk it's more in the last 15 years honestly proms etc really didn't happen when i was at school it's probably a good job the less pictures of me with the in terrible perm and the really bad choice of dress that I wore to one of my leaving dues because I felt that steel toe cap boots would definitely go with it. It's good that these things were not recorded. So she's excited 
And the dance is being held in the school gymnasium, as we expect. There's going to be a lot of safety, of course. We wouldn't understand that because there's going to be people who are protecting the kids. There's going to be teachers there. So when you're a parent, you send your child to one of these events without any care or concern. You just want them to have the best time possible. Jane's dad drops her off about 6 p.m. And he said to her that he's going to pick her up about 11 p.m. But he also said to her, listen, you know what? If you want to leave any earlier, you can just call me any time. And apparently he watched her as she excitedly ran into the gymnasium with her girlfriends. And that is just such a typical reaction, isn't it? You're just thinking about all the fun that you're going to have and you anticipate possibilities at that age. And certainly I imagine that's exactly what she was doing. Now it gets to around 9pm. So she's been there three hours at this point and Jane decides that it's too much. She wants to leave the dance, the music is too loud, the strobe lighting is giving her a headache. So many people relate to that. It can be one of those things, particularly if you're quite a sensory person, that can send you overboard because psychologically it feels very overwhelming when you've got the music, you've got the strobe lighting, everything feels really intense. And a member of staff actually saw her leave the building at this point. Now, Jane goes outside and as she's arranged with her dad, she calls him. But just as she's about to actually connect to her father, she sees somebody that she knows, 15-year-old fellow student Cody Smith, and he comes over to her, he says, well, why don't you just come and join us? Come and see me and my friends. We're all at a picnic table. We're on the school grounds. It's safe. And this is apparently a locked area in a courtyard, but it's also somewhere that local young people would go and hang out, they'd drink, they smoke weed, and they kind of felt safe doing it. They didn't feel they were gonna get caught doing anything wrong there. So it's kind of a safe haven for hanging out. Bear in mind, Jane has known Smith since middle school. Now for everybody listening, we all know what it is like when you see a friendly face, a connection from your past, somebody that you've been aware of and had relational experience as friends or peers, for many years, it immediately makes you feel that you don't have anything to worry about. At the end of the day, you trust them and you feel happy in their company. That's what happens. She trusts him and she accepts that invitation because she considers him a friend. And she's got some fresh air. It's probably quite exciting getting invited over to a new group to sit with and chill with. And she probably is thinking, well, maybe I'll see how I feel. I'll give it a few more minutes before I go home. You know, this is a night out. I'm all dressed up. May as well make use of this situation to my advantage. So they get over to the picnic table. And this is in that dark area of this courtyard. And there are apparently five other males there at that point. This includes Jose Matano. He's 18. And also 21-year-old Salvador Rodriguez. Now she sits down, everything's fine. The young men are really polite. Rodriguez even puts his jacket down on the bench so that she can sit on it. So again, that's really confirming for her. At the end of the day, she has nothing to worry about. They're being super kind. One of the things that is occurring is this group of young people are drinking and they're drinking a bottle of brandy. And we have to remember how strong brandy is. I mean, it's such a high level alcohol content. And if you're not a drinker, it doesn't take much of that to get you absolutely smashed. Now, apparently that bottle of brandy Smith had earlier stolen. So again, that gives us an insight into some of Smith's behavior. She might trust him, but there are clearly actions and behaviors that she likely would not agree with. Now, at this point, Jane is 16. She has never drunk before. But apparently that night, she was feeling quite emotional and it was really understandable why she was feeling emotional. She'd actually discovered that her parents were getting divorced and that's just such a seismic shift in your life. She's about to have a night out with friends. She's excited and dressed up and then actually that turns into an event where she realises that there is the end of her parents' marriage. And that's going to be really disconcerting and upsetting. And it's also going to change the way that she feels about her world completely. Because as a young person, we tend to just go along believing it will all be okay when we've got secure foundations. And to suddenly have this new direction placed on you and also a new direction you have no control over, 
It's so conflicting and it's so divisive for you. And that's no doubt why she had the headache, as well as the fact that she was in that overstimulated environment. There will have been something about her dealing with that stress and knowledge and overwhelming sense of change. So because of this, and because she's looking potentially for a way of medicating some of that agony, she decides that she wants to drink some of the alcohol. So she's encouraged, clearly, by the boys. And also, we've got to remember the fact that you want to fit in with your peers. You don't want to seem like you're lame and you're an individual who's not just getting in with the crowd. So she picks up the bottle, she starts to drink from it. Bear in mind, she is completely unprepared for the strengths and the effects of it. And really, that's where peers are meant to come in. If somebody says, you know, I've not really drank before, or they clearly seem to be drinking in a way that suggests they don't know how strong this is, it's your job as a peer to tell them, listen, really go easy. Because essentially tolerance takes time to build up and we all know what can happen when somebody is not a drinker and they end up consuming a lot. Now, after a while of sitting there, not too long, she actually says to the group that she needs to go. And the reason for that is that headache is still there, her head's still hurting, but also she needs to be up the next morning for church. And that statement in itself very much lends itself to the type of character that we're dealing with where Jane is concerned. She's a good girl. She doesn't drink, she doesn't take drugs. She doesn't even hang out with boys. She's just somebody who has found herself a victim of circumstance in this moment. She's been sad. She's tried to medicate that a little bit with alcohol, but it's not worked. She's obviously feeling quite sad and she just wants to go home and she wants to make sure that she's in a good state for church the next morning. Now, at this point, Smith is like, yep, yeah, see ya. Says he's going to see her on Monday. However, when she tries to stand up, she actually feels dizzy. And at this moment, she falls back and most of us I'm sure listening have been in that situation where you've overdone it and you're okay when you're kind of balanced and sat down in a moment you come to your reality of actually having to move forward it's really disorientating so the alcohol's really taken effect at this point and she starts vomiting pretty quickly after that and it can also actually mean that things are going wrong your body's rejecting the alcohol because it's going through a poisoning state so she's obviously had quite a lot for her size and for her situation now as this is all playing out all the men start to join the group so this includes 19 year old manuel ortega which is rodriguez's former roommate Apparently, he's known as a quiet skateboarder at the time, but he also had a nickname, Tweaker. So tweaking is something that is often applied to drugs. Actually, it's usually to do with what somebody is like when they're searching for drugs because they're coming down. But Tweaker relates to behaviour. And as far as he is concerned, he's given this nickname because he's got really erratic behaviour when he's drunk. And that's problematic. We've probably all had at least experiences with people who become very nasty when they're drunk or violent when they're drunk. They're not great people to be around. Any unpredictability is problematic in this situation because if you're going to have a drink with somebody, you want to feel safe in their company. Now, this night, he had been drinking with a guy called Elvis Torrantes. He was 22, so a little bit older. Now, Jane, I will tell you now, just so you're aware about it, from this point on, after she's been vomiting, she literally recalls nothing. Absolutely nothing that happens during the next couple of hours. And I would personally say that this is a blessing. In fact, the last thing that she remembers is a bottle of brandy being held to her lips and the fact that she is forced to drink that brand. I mean, that's traumatic enough. When somebody removes your control and takes over what you put in your body, that's incredibly dominating and incredibly inappropriate. But for her, this is essentially when she blacks out. And some people will say, well, that blackout will be caused because of the alcohol and she'll essentially be unconscious to some degree and not aware of what is happening. I suppose in my field, others will argue that realistically, when somebody is highly traumatized, the brain has got an incredible capacity to try to protect that person. And sometimes during enormous trauma, our brain can literally shut down. We see this across the spectrum, right up until things like DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder, where people literally experience breaks in their consciousness where other characters that have been designed to protect them from trauma 
come into play and different personalities, whilst rare, really rare, although apparently not on TikTok. Apparently on TikTok, DID is really popular and everyone knows who the alters are. Absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. DID is a very rare condition where people have different personalities. Just throwing it out there, bit of a bugbear for me. A lot of self-diagnosis going on those platforms and it's really not great for people. But when it comes down to the fact that she's got these blanks, it could be the alcohol, it could also be a really high level trauma reaction, a protective mechanism kicking in. Now from some witness accounts, some of the men actually at this point proposition her for sex. And fortunately, it's a tale as old of time when certain individuals see vulnerability the predatory nature really comes out and as most people will be aware when it comes down to consent you have to be compass mentors to consent to sexual connection so if you are very drunk you cannot consent even if the person seems willing it is not actually seen as legally correct so we know a lot more about that these days but clearly if you are under the influence heavily then you cannot give your permission. But nonetheless, we see this play out time and time and time again, where people still feel it's acceptable and appropriate to proposition somebody in such a state. So they're asking her for sex. And Torrente's later actually claimed that he had been flirting mutually with the 16 year old and that this had led to him sexually touching her, even though he also added that she was clearly wasted. So no, where's the flirting? Where is the flirting when somebody is wasted? We all know what people look like when they're wasted. When we think about flirting, flirtatious behavior is a conscious reality in the way you act. You are purposefully homing in on one or two people potentially, and then you are using your body language and your language as in verbal to kind of connect with them in an intimate manner that says, maybe there is something that could go on from this point of view, the situation. Maybe we could take this to a different level. And you need to be completely aware because flirting takes quite a lot of energy. We've all been there. Flirting is actually quite hard work. For women, there's a lot of head flicking. The point is, behaviorally when you're wasted you're just trying to stand up or not vomit so the fact that he's saying that there was mutual flirting absolute rubbish he was probably just very much in her space and then started to touch her inappropriately and she couldn't protest you know having somebody who's near unconscious they can't really protest your advances sadly now everyone who is present in that situation they were aware that she was heavily intoxicated and even though she isn't very capable of protecting herself in this moment in time she is trying her best to refuse those advances so you can imagine she's disorientated she's confused she's obviously going to be dominated physically because these are all guys and even though they're touching her, she's clearly trying to knock them away and at this point as opposed to those men thinking to themselves, okay, this is ridiculous. We have somebody who is obviously very vulnerable, is clearly highly under the influence, and we shouldn't go anywhere near her aside from maybe to get her some help. No, that's not what occurs. This group, they just turn very quickly, very violent. And I mean, very violent. So first of all, they take her over to this concrete bench. It's like a slab. And at this point, they literally just start slapping her and then they start tearing her clothes off. Now, apparently the main instigator of this behavior that I'm talking about is Ortega. And apparently he shouts out, I'm next. And then he basically tears off her underwear and he starts to hit her, which is so left field from what we were talking about earlier on, where she's just gone over to kind of hang out with a friend who she trusts. And now she's got this pack of young men attacking her when she's got no capacity or ability to protect herself. Someone apparently also then gets the brandy and basically pours it onto her vagina and then others are hitting her consistently. Then Ortega, who we know is fully aware of just how under the influence she is and how vulnerable she is, he then starts trying to force her to give him oral sex, which isn't gonna happen. First of all, even though she's highly drunk and intoxicated and not very aware of what's happening, she clenches her jaw. So there must be some kind of consciousness that something is happening to her. 
but her teeth are clenched. So she's preventing that occurring, but that's not going to stop him from trying to carry on. So he just starts punching her repeatedly in the face and in the head. And bear in mind, there's no defense here. She's not trying to protect herself, which is an automatic reality when somebody is being violent towards us in that way. And as this is playing out, you could imagine that other members would be horrified. Other members would be kind of pulling this guy away and saying no more. But no, it seems that as opposed to this dissuading anyone, just word spreads and more young men start quickly arriving at the scene. So this isn't deterring anyone. This is exciting people and they're going to see what's happening. Two of those are 16-year-old Ari Morales and his friend 17-year-old Marcella's Peter. They had actually been unable to get into the dance earlier on, so they'd just been hanging around the courtyard, just likely thinking that there's going to be some teens to play out with. And they get told that there is a drunk white girl around the back of the school having sex with everybody. Now, that deeply concerns me on a range of levels. Clearly the fact that there is this misappropriation of reality, which is that there is this girl having sex with everybody. There's not a girl having sex with everybody. There is a highly inebriated young woman being sexually violated by a pack of boys. This is a woman who has had no say in the matter. She's a victim, end of. She's a child, she's 16. The term woman isn't even appropriate. But also the reference to white. So to me, there is also a racial motivation there. A drunk white girl. And if you think about using race in any other context, that would immediately be jumped on because they are pinpointing, identifying a racial difference and that is being used to excite them further. So that is deeply worrying as far as I'm concerned. It's almost like it's another inciting reality as to why they legitimately feel that they can carry out that behavior. So they run around to see what's going on. And at this point, I guess that I could have some sympathy and empathy with those two at this moment, because with respect, one could argue, well, they just want to know if that's really happening. You know, no one's saying a girl is being sexually violated and attacked. They're saying this girl wants it, shall we say. And that's why they're going around to see her. When they arrive, there's about 20 people, 20 people. And they're all standing around this completely semi-conscious girl. Can you imagine the amount of opportunity there is there to stop this kind of profoundly disgraceful behavior? Well, people are just watching. They actually see or take a puncher in the face. They see him punching it in her head. Around 10 times they witness that. And when they see that it's because she won't give him oral sex, it's just a repetitive reality that he's just going to punch her and punch her because he's angry that she isn't giving in because she hasn't got the capacity, as we know. But Ortega doesn't see this. He's just absolutely incensed. Also, he kicks her in the face. And at this point, she is literally vomiting whilst being held up. So she is clearly in a really physiologically problematic, stroke dangerous reality. Now, according to Peter, Ortega then drags her over to this darker spot, which is near a dumpster. And they actually witness that he steps on her face. Now, when Morales approaches him, he actually turns to him and says, back off, cuz, I'm trying to get my D-I-C-K sucked. So he's very aware of what he's doing, what he wants to achieve, and he also doesn't want anybody to stop him. Now, according to witnesses, at one point, Ortega, who is clearly at this point the ringleader in the abuse, he actually shouts to the others, let's pull a train on her. Now, that is a reference to gang rape. And then apparently he hits her really, really hard. Actually, the quote is super hard in the face. Montano then joins in the abuse. Now, by this point, Jane is completely unconscious. She's naked from the waist down. She's lying with her legs open, so she's highly vulnerable obviously completely without any potential resistance because she can't resist. And he takes out a condom and then he puts it on and basically proceeds to rape her. And all the while, Ortega continues to hit her. So we're not just talking about sexual molestation and violation. We're talking about somebody potentially trying to kill her at this moment in time. And what are the crowd doing? 
nothing. They're just watching. Now, the thing about being a bystander is very often psychologically, what bystanders will believe is, ah, oh, somebody else will take responsibility for stopping this happening. But the problem is if everybody has that mentality, things don't change. People don't intervene. And actually, on criminal levels, if you are literally witnessing a crime play out in real time and you do absolutely nothing to stop it and you are seen as part of a group mentality in that moment, you are going to be considered complicit in a lot of cases. So you're not just failing to protect that person who's enduring the horror. You're actually failing to protect yourself when it comes down to your potential future and charges you might meet. But still, in spite of watching this horrific rape play out, they just watch. Now, it doesn't take long before Montana stops and actually gets up and says that he's just playing, which he wasn't. He was raping her. But again, maybe something's clocked with him. There's a lot of witnesses. I don't necessarily intimately know all of them. My friends might protect me, but maybe some of these won't. So the idea of just saying, hey, it's just a joke, not really happening. That's the way I suppose of disarming the reality of what he's doing. And then he's actually seen to take the condom off and throw it into some bushes. But then he actually goes over and starts looking for it. Now, why does he do that? He goes there because he knows there's going to be incriminating forensic evidence on there. He doesn't want anybody to find it. So this is somebody who is completely aware of what he's doing. This is an individual who doesn't want to be caught for it. And the very fact that they've been saying there was just some girl wanting to have sex with all these boys, and yet he's feeling the need to protect himself by picking up a condom and hiding it, that absolutely demonstrates that he knows exactly what he's doing and knows it's wrong. Now, Morales, he's watched all of this happen. You'd imagine that he would be absolutely horrified, but no. He just decides that he's going to join in the abuse as well. So whilst Jane is lay there, literally moaning and groaning and very badly injured on the ground, he actually inserts the antenna of a walkie-talkie into her vagina. And then he actually steals her ring and then he urinates on her. I mean, the degrading reality of that explanation is so, so profound, isn't it? that she's just some object to be raped however they see fit, to have things stolen from her, all the while being horribly beaten. The fact that he wheezes on her, it demonstrates, doesn't it, that absolute disrespect. It's to humiliate her, deride her. It's disgraceful. His friend, Peter, he also later down the line admits that he fondled her, so this is like a free-for-all. It's absolutely horrifying. The witnesses in this case stated that Jane was literally subjected to inhuman, degrading abuse. At one point, Ortega even gets his skateboard and he forcefully shoves it into her vagina area. So you can imagine what that would feel like if somebody took a very heavy object and forcefully hits you in that area. This is when she's slouched on the ground. Also, Ortega and Montana also drag her along the ground whilst slapping her buttocks repeatedly. And many others who were watching, they actually joined in too. They're slapping her buttocks, they're touching her genitals, and they're all apparently laughing. They're chanting even. In fact, they were encouraging one another to carry out more abuse. Some were even filming it on their phones. Some were taking pictures. What kind of individuals would do that? I appreciate that we live in a society these days where so much is put online. Everyone's looking for those likes. Everyone's looking for those viral videos. But we are talking about a child being hideously molested and in a very dangerous situation now physically. She's been horribly beaten. They've witnessed this. And... They have time to put their phones on and take video, but they don't have time to call 911. At the end of the day, you can do that with even telling people who you are. And all the while, this girl is becoming more and more desperately unwell because of the actions. Now, two students, Rodriguez and his friend Robert Baroga, now they allegedly tried to unsuccessfully stop the abuse, but apparently no one would listen to them. And again, that's something that we can see 
quite commonly in scenarios where people are the more and there are fewer people trying to actually do the right thing. When there are more individuals on the side of the negativity, it can be really challenging to actually get people to listen to what you need to have change because obviously everyone else is on the same side. So apparently they do try. And also Rodriguez said that he did try to cover up Jane's body at some point with his shirt because he wanted to protect her dignity. And he actually told Baroga, I'm not going to be part of this shit. And he left. Now, he didn't call the police that night, which he should have. I appreciate that he tried to protect her to some degree, at least her dignity. But the point is, he could have called the police. But instead, it takes him days to contact the police to tell him what he knew. He didn't get help at the time and what she needed was help at the time and I know that compared to the others he's certainly more pro-social but still why would you not call the police now he said I was scared of the consequences I was scared of being considered a snitch in a city like Richmond well don't be a snitch call the police see a violent assault is happening and just let them come and deal with it don't leave a girl to potentially die in the most violent of ways, in a, a place where she's being treated like an object that can be absolutely grotesquely attacked and discarded just for the pleasure of these odd men who should at their ages absolutely be fully aware of the gravity of their actions. That girl suffered for two hours at least two hours, they think maybe two and a half hours of this sustained physical and sexual abuse. Now, a 22-year-old man actually heard two Hispanic males and one black male near the school shouting, there's a drunk girl behind Richmond High. If you guys want to F-U-C-K, go ahead. This sense of treating her like a piece of meat, like, an open opportunity for anybody to violate. The dehumanization, the refusal to acknowledge the humanity of this 16 year old girl, seeing her as something for your pleasure at no matter what the cost to her and literally amplifying the message by shouting it to other people because she's so irrelevant. And if you wanna go and use her, well, you're welcome to. Now that person who heard that, he tells his sister-in-law what he's heard and she immediately and rightfully calls 911. Says there's this naked drunk girl on the school grounds and thank God that kind of an individual exists in this world because clearly her immediacy is to think, I don't know a lot what's going on here, but I'm not taking any risks and chances. There is potentially a girl in grave danger or there is a girl who's being vulnerable and still needs protection. So either way, she doesn't remove herself from that scenario. She takes full responsibility for it, and I'm so glad that she did. 911, where's your emergency? Hi, um, it's in Richmond High School. What's going on? Um, there's a girl that's like hecka drunk, and, and she's naked. Where at at the high school? It's in the back in um, Amherst and Hayes. Is she on the school property? Yeah, she's like in in, in the back though. She's like by the dumpsters. By the dumpsters? Mm -hmm. Is she saying anything? Um, is she saying anything? She, she, she just passed. Okay. She's probably intoxicated because um, she's naked. Is she, she black or white? Is she black or white or what? Oh, we, ha we haven't seen her. We heard that from um, two of um, our friends. Okay. We so didn't want to go back there because we're scared. <laughs> Do we know if there was anybody around her? Um, uh, is there anybody around her? Uh, we, people, people that passed by her have been seeing her, but nobody wants to call a cop, so we decided to call. Okay, and how old do you think she is? Um, she, they say she looks like a ninth grader, like about 15, 16, probably. What's your name? Um, Maggie. Okay, Maggie, we'll get someone out there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay. Now, her father, bear in mind, he was coming to pick her up anyway, so he'd set off to collect her about 10.45 p.m. because they were agreed that she'd be finished for 11. And it's during the drive to the school to pick her up, he actually receives a phone call from his daughter's mobile. This is at 10.52 p.m. So, of course, he expects that. And when he expects to have that call from her, it's going to be his daughter's voice that he hears on the other end. But no. 
Because after he immediately answers the phone with a hello, what he doesn't recognize is the voice on the other end. And so his absolute horror, and I can only imagine terror, the male who's on the other end of the phone tells this loving father that there were five of them who thought his daughter was a wonderful fuck. Can you imagine the experience of hearing that being said to you when you've got your gorgeous 16 year old daughter whose dress you've bought, who was excited to be going to that dance and then you know immediately something truly terrible could have happened. They also tell him that she gave great blowjobs and then the caller hangs up. At this point, her father repeatedly tries to call his daughter, no one answers. And he's really shocked, he's really concerned, he's terrified, but at the same time he's thinking, you know what, hey, we've all been at high school, at the end of the day it could just be a prank. And he's just hoping. She's gonna get to school, I'm gonna pick her up, it's all gonna be fine, I don't have anything to worry about, I'm being stupid. But that isn't the reality. Now in total, Jane, who was barely conscious, or completely unconscious, was brutally raped and beaten for two to two and a half hours. During that time, around 20 people witnessed that attack, as I've said, not one of them contacted the police. Meanwhile, the police officer had received that dispatch call about the naked female on the grounds of Richmond High School. So they got there real quick. They were there within a few minutes. They were obviously deeply concerned about this. They go around shining the car spotlight into the school courtyard and immediately it illuminates this group of young men and the group of young men who see them start to run. And we all know that young men who see the police and start to run have nothing to hide ever, do they? It's like, it's the police. I should just go for a really fast jog now because I'm completely innocent. So immediately the police are like, something bad is happening here. So the patrol car gives chase. Also an officer climbs over the railings into the courtyard and then he uses his torch to look around and wow. Instantly, he spots the body of a young female and she's slumped over a support bar. She's under a picnic table and actually only the tips of her feet and the side of her face were touching the ground. He looks at her and she is limp. She's unconscious, she's unresponsive and she's naked from the waist down. He knows immediately something dreadful has happened. The lavender dress is bunched up around her waist. Her face is literally covered in vomit and the officer genuinely thought she was dead. But when he goes over to shake her, just to see whether she is dead, she moans. He could also immediately see, and bear in mind, this is in the dark, he's got a light, but at the end of the day, it's hard to see compared to how it would be in daylight, but he can see straight away that she's got some real trauma to her vaginal area. It was really red, covered in dirt, debris. So it's clear. This has not been a consensual experience. This young girl has been violently assaulted. The officer at this point waits with her, makes sure that no one else comes back to harm her and they wait for the paramedics. One of the things that he doesn't do though, he doesn't move her because he doesn't want to cause any further injury because he knows that she could potentially be clinging on to life and anything that he does without medical presence being there could compromise her. Now, meanwhile, Jane's dad, has arrived at the school, he's just waiting in the car park for his daughter, but she does not come. In the end, the caretaker comes out and says, look, there's no one left inside. And at this point, that dawning reality that maybe that phone call actually was something that had actually happened and played out. Maybe his daughter had been a victim. So he starts to panic. And then he spots a police car. It's driving slowly by, clearly scoping out the area to see whether they can see these guys. He also notices that it's spotlights on. And then as it reaches the corner, it speeds up. So Jane's father just follows in the direction that it's headed because he's aware that maybe, just maybe, that could lead him to his daughter. Then ahead of him, he sees more police officers and a crowd of onlookers. And you can only begin to imagine putting yourself in that position as your stomach just drops, knowing that the likelihood of that phone call actually being based in some kind of twisted what reality is possible. 
At this point, he informs an officer that he's looking for his daughter, says that she's missing, says that she was wearing a lavender dress. And then shortly after that, another officer approaches him and addresses him by his name. Immediately, he fears the worst because he hadn't given anyone his name. So at this point that he is given the worst news in the world, his daughter had been raped and that she needed to be taken to hospital immediately because her life was in the balance. Now he's really angry at this point, he's really distraught and apparently he swore and he shook a nearby fence whilst officers are all the while trying to calm him down and comfort him. You can completely understand that. All you'd want to do in that moment is to kill the perpetrators. Every parent would want to kill the perpetrators in that moment. You cannot believe that somebody has taken the most precious person in the world to you, an individual you would lay down your life for, would die without hesitation for. You left them for a few hours to be able to go and have their rite of passage at a homecoming dance and you're finding out that there is a strong potential in this moment that she might not make it and that those potential moments that she'd endured before were so life-changing and transformative that either way, live or die, your life has changed beyond recognition in that moment. Whilst he's angrily expressing this, Jane's carried past him on a gurney and her face is so swollen that she was barely recognisable. There was vomit in her hair. She just looked so unwell, so broken. And like any loving father, he just tells me he loves her very much, just begs her to hold on. Now she wasn't conscious enough to respond, but as we know, hearing is something that happens even when we are in situations where we can't communicate. Hearing is one of the last senses to go when you're dying. So actually just because she isn't responding doesn't mean that she isn't hearing that father's love and knowing that finally in that moment she's safe. Jane's injuries, they were horrific. They were so serious that they actually had to call a helicopter ambulance because they needed to get her to be taken care of by the best people possible. They needed to make sure that she had the best chance of life. It actually landed about half a mile from the crime scene and at this point she's flown to the John Muir Medical Center, that's in Walnut Creek, and she is in an absolutely critical condition. Now, obviously the police have been very concerned about apprehending the actual perpetrators and they'd managed to catch Ortega. He was really drunk, he was slurring, he was highly aggressive. Not the best thing to be when you're being arrested. It's one of those things, isn't it, where these kind of violent perpetrators think that it's good to act in a really aggressive and resistant manner when they're dealing with people who can literally put them in prison for a very long time. But who am I to throw out such sensibilities and suggestions about how to act when you're being arrested? But immediately it's all about, I'm innocent, it was all consensual. Was that, it was all consensual. It was all consensual. Why is she in critical condition? being flown to a hospital because she wanted it to happen. I mean, genuinely, this kind of individual has a small group of brain cells who are all resistant to one another. They're trying to remove their cells from one another because they don't like any of each other within the brain. That's what's going on. This kind of person has very little grey matter functioning appropriately. Just throwing it out there. He actually said, she wanted me. I didn't rape her. She's a grown ass woman. Sorry, she's 16, you absolute little freak. She's 16. She's a child, literally a child. She can't even legally drink. Shut up. But anyway, that's what he's saying. She was so drunk, she didn't even know what was going on. This is his quote. I wasn't the only one. There was hella people. She wanted it. Bitch wanted it. Bitch wanted the dick. She wanted all of us. Do you know, honestly, this is why I find hardcore pornography really psychologically damaging for populations of young men, genuinely. When you know and work in sexual dysfunction as I have, I can tell you that kind of language comes from a very specific area of pornography. 
Now, I am not saying that hardcore pornography is responsible for this situation. I am saying that when you have a society that has a permission base for types of videos that are legal, but involve women being, shall we say, violated in every single way. I know that they're consenting, but I just don't feel that having 20, 30 men doing that to one woman in a video does anything but create these sub-realities in the minds of some young individuals that makes them feel that there's a legitimate cause to act in these kind of ways. And I find it horrifying. And certainly the language that he just used then, that to me seems like it's come straight out of one of these horrible films. And at one point he even says the words, I just wanted to pimp her out. Again, this is a young man who's 19 years of age, who's using this kind of language. Also, then he goes on to tell the officer, just shoot me in the head, I don't care. I've been alive 19 years and nobody don't care about me. I mean, obviously that would be one quick resolution to a human predator being on our streets, but I don't think it's actually that legal to just go about and shoot somebody. But the other thing, okay, he's playing the victim. I've been alive 19 years, nobody don't care about me. At the end of the day, we appreciate some people are brought up in really horrible circumstances and we have empathy and sympathy for that. But hey, they don't turn into violent predators and rapists. Sorry, you lost any consideration for sympathy and empathy when you violated this kid and actually referred to her as some kind of individual wanting it even though she's now in critical care. Oh, at the end of the day, I would have had quite a few uses for the skateboard. Very hard and can be swung very fast. Throwing it out there. Now, when they collect evidence from the crime scene, obviously there's quite a lot there. So they find possessions of Jane's, including her student ID card, jewelry shoes. They find her ripped underwear and stockings. And again, very indicative of somebody who's consensually engaged, right? When they literally rip your underwear and stockings off. I mean, it's not in context whatsoever with the story being told. They find makeup because things are scattered around. They also find the walkie-talkie that was used to violate her. They find used condoms and they collect those. There are sperm cells, blood stains that they collect. All of those are identified on lots of different items. And during that period of time, they're able to find DNA profiles for Ortega, Matano, Peter, and another man, 42-year-old John Crane. I actually cannot believe that in this pack there was a man of 42 who didn't jump in and try to protect Jane they just used her that to me is demonstrative of the absolute base of humanity the scraping the bottom of the barrel 42 year old man and he took advantage of an incredibly drunk, stroke unconscious, stroke very, very badly injured 16 year old girl. I swear, hell has some very specific places for these absolute warped not rights. And I'm not trying to say that a 42 year old man is somehow more guilty and responsible than a 19 year old man. They are all grotesque human beings who deserve to spend the rest of their lives fundamentally locked somewhere safe and avoidant of any other females ever again. But for me, when you're 42, you've had a long time to develop conscience and understanding and legal frameworks. You know right from wrong. And at the end of the day, you should act with a care and capacity for the most vulnerable. And a 16 year old girl who's drunk and injured is highly vulnerable. Taking advantage of her that way, ugh. You literally deserve to never see the light of day again, as far as I'm concerned. Jane, of course, when she's at hospital, she's also swabbed for DNA evidence. And when she is, sperm cells from Ortega and Crane are actually found on her mouth and neck. They are all banged to rights, clearly. Now, when Jane's father arrived, absolutely terrorised at this point and devastated at the hospital, she's actually in the intensive care unit. And... He described her as being unresponsive and looking almost dead. It's incomprehensible to place yourself in that position unless you've been there, isn't it? Your child, just totally helpless, 
life in the balance and feeling just that sense of powerlessness and also rage all in the same moment. When they established her full injuries, it came to light that she was so lucky that she had been found at that point because they said without medical help, she would have died. First of all, because when somebody drinks, we see that hypothermia sets in a lot more quickly and her body temperature had fallen very dangerously low and actually she'd been getting colder and because of her weight. So her weight was just 93 pounds, that's six and a half stone. So you can imagine how little she was and her blood alcohol level was 0.355%. That's almost a fatal amount because anywhere between 0.3 and 0.4% is likely to result in alcohol poisoning and anything over four percent is likely to be fatal and that leads to respiratory arrest now doctors established that her upper brain powers had actually not been sending any signals down to the rest of her body because that's the toxicity of the alcohol and when she was admitted to hospital she was in an absolutely critical condition she'd suffered significant head trauma she was concussed She'd even fallen into a coma. She had swelling on her brain because obviously she had those constant repeated blows to the head. Yeah, sounds consensual, doesn't it, guys? It sounds like she really wanted this, which is, of course, the story that those boys are telling. At this point, she's also in respiratory failure. She's suffering heart irregularities and she is literally covered in bruises from head to toe. And they could tell, not even by examining her, just by observation, that she had suffered the most serious sexual abuse, there were abrasions and lacerations all over her body, all over her buttocks, all over her legs, as well as clearly on her vaginal area and her anus. And this 16 year old girl has endured this and all she wanted was to go to a party, have some fun with her friends and trust that she could have a drink with a group of strangers because she trusted one of the individuals there. And now she's in a critical condition, her life hanging in the balance in hospital. When Jane finally regains consciousness, she's totally overwhelmed. First of all, she finds herself in a hospital with a tube down her throat. And yet when she recollects what happened, the last thing that she remembers is trying to leave the group of boys that she'd been drinking with at the school bench. And then she'd fallen down, she was very intoxicated, but that was it. The next thing, she's just waking up in hospital and obviously she recognises that her whole body is in absolute excruciating pain. Her face, her ears, they were so badly swollen that people didn't recognise her. So you can imagine the pressure that she felt when she came around. Also her jaw apparently felt like it was dislocated and Obviously, when it came down to her genital areas, there was a constant throbbing there. So she would have had the insight that something terrible had happened to her. She actually remains in hospital for several days, but fortunately, she survives. And that's something that we just have to thank divine intervention for. My God, how grateful must we all be to that girl who called the police when she was told that there was a girl potentially in distress or potentially at risk. She saved that day. Now, the day after this horrific attack, Morales, Matano and Peter, they're all at this mutual friend's house. And there's a witness there. This is a student at Richmond High. And they hear them discussing the rape and they're laughing and they're boasting about it. Matano says he'd fucked her. Peter said he'd finger banged her. And Morales said he'd pissed on her. Honestly, these kind of human predators are the worst that society can ever find. To take glee in the reality of what they've done to this child, to feel that it's worth bragging about, shows a lack of conscience, a lack of consciousness as well about their actions. And certainly she is nobody to them, just an object for their own pleasure that they can do whatever they wish to. But that person overhears and obviously finds it very concerning and very worrying. So six men are ultimately either arrested or handed themselves in to be fair, because some of them come forward. And this is all in connection with what had played out that night. Now the youngest of these is Cody Smith. Now remember that's Jane's friend. 
That's the person who invited her over to the group in the first place. Now, initially, he gets charged with quite a lot of offences. He'd also taken Jane's phone. And bear in mind, people made calls to her father. So at the end of the day, that does seem to implicate him, in my opinion. And they actually find that phone later in his room. But apparently, down the line, all charges against him were later dismissed. I'm not sure why. In my own mind, even though, obviously, when people give evidence against certain people, it means that they'll be seen more favourably when it comes down to their charges. But for me, how did he have that phone in his room? The phone that somebody called Jane's father with, laughing and bragging about abusing her. Now, several of the remaining defendants, they all faced charges for acting in concert with others, which is what I was talking about earlier on, which is where if you're a defendant, you don't have to actually have committed every element of a crime to actually be found guilty. You know, if you played a small part in it, you played a part in it, you're still guilty of a crime. And if they were acting for a common purpose, which is in this case a gang rape, they are all culpable. It's as simple as that. They're able to identify Ortega as the actual ringleader and as a perpetrator of much of the physical abuse. I think we've already covered that. He's clearly the main predator in that situation. He'd sexually assaulted Jane. He'd very actively encouraged others to do the same. So we get to September 2012 and he ultimately pleads guilty to rape in concert, rape by a foreign object in concert, forced oral copulation in concert resulting in great bodily injury and also robbery. Now in doing so, in taking that guilty plea, he basically avoids a life sentence. And it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Because he's going to get found by guilty every single day of the week. There is no way he would walk away from this situation. And a life sentence without parole means he's never going to have freedom. But instead, because he says he's guilty, he gets sentenced to 32 years. And, you know, that's a long time. In the UK, that would not happen. I have to stand by the fact that in the USA, when it comes down to these horrible crimes, they do give sentences that I think are really appropriate. Now, Morales, he pleads guilty to rape by a foreign object in concert and pleaded no contest to rape in concert and forcible oral copulation in concert. And he gets 27 years in January 2013. So obviously that's indicative that he wasn't the ringleader, but still was a serious party in this crime. Now, interestingly, Montano and Peter, they plead not guilty to charges of rape rape with a foreign object and forced oral copulation because they are both completely stupid. Sorry, so let's like explore that a little bit. Montano, Peter, are you saying that you want to plead not guilty? We want to plead not guilty. Really? Absolutely 100% not guilty. Absolutely 100% not guilty. Totally not guilty. Was anybody there? Maybe 19, 18, 19 people were there who all witnessed what you did. 18 or 19 people who were there, did they witness what we did? We're not saying because we are not guilty. I'm pretty sure that from the witness testimony, everybody has you banged to rights, literally visually watching what you did to that girl, including forensic DNA evidence, just throwing it in there. We are completely innocent. Do you have any functioning brain cells? Have they scammed you? Is there anything going on in there? Is it just like a recurring circle of nothingness, possibly. Just saying I'm not guilty. Honestly, Matano and Peter genuinely plead not guilty. Somehow they thought that they were gonna get away with this. So of course, by June 2013, the case has to go to trial. Morales acted actually as a prosecution witness at this moment in time. And Jane, at this moment in time, gives evidence for the first time since she's gone through this horrific ordeal. So we now have two really key players who can quite clearly demonstrate the guilt of these individuals. Now, don't get me wrong, Jane has to tell the court, honestly, she doesn't remember being sexually assaulted because she was completely blanked out for that, thank God. Ultimately, Montano was convicted on all counts because they didn't even probably need a jury, did they? Just like Kathleen, from the canteen at lunch decide because it's so clearly evidence. I have no idea what the defense was doing, even allowing them to do that. Maybe these individuals were so delusional, narcissistic, superior and arrogant that they believed that they could somehow get away with it. 
But if I had been the defense, I would have been like, guys, you are not walking from this. Do you want to spend a very long time in prison or do you just want to accept the charges and hope that there is some kind of leniency on you? But absolutely not. They went ahead. And Montano is convicted on all counts, sentenced to 33 years to life, to life. So may never get out. That is literally the maximum sentence possible for the offences. Peter is also convicted on all counts. He gets 29 years to life. So a really stupid move, but an incredibly satisfying one for people like me. Because there is nothing better than somebody who thinks that they can outsmart the law and essentially ensures that the likelihood is they will never be free again. Now, bear in mind, Peter got a year less but the reason that he got a year less from Montano is that he was actually a minor at the time of the offence. So they tend to be more lenient in that way. It was only a year. And both of those unsuccessfully appealed their sentences in 2019. Of course they did, because that's the process. At the end of the day, they were active participants in this brutality. And as active participants, they absolutely deserve those sentences. I think that one of the most powerful things that any kind of perpetrator is to take accountability and responsibility for their crimes. And if you don't, then you deserve to be treated more harshly by the system. Then we have, of course, our older party and perpetrator, John Crane, in his 40s, and also 25-year-old Elvis Torrentes. They're the last defendants who were essentially tried. Now, Crane pleads guilty to statutory rape, and this means he avoided the more serious conviction of forcible rape in concert. He gets three years. I'm not going to pretend I understand the leniency of that sentence. I would imagine there's a lot of plea deal bargains going on there. And if you say this and you witness this, and this means that our main perpetrators get this long, then we will be more lenient with you. And then we have Torrentes who pleads guilty to sexual penetration of an intoxicated person. And to be fair, this particular individual, Torrentes, had initially been charged with more serious offences, including rape while acting in concert. So he ends up getting six years, which is incomparably lenient compared to what we've just explored where the other defendants were concerned. But I suppose we all have to agree that we need witnesses and the more engaged you were in the crime, the more likely your witness testimony is going to be taken seriously and they probably want the main players. And if that sacrifices a certain amount of years in prison for certain individuals who are also defendants, they do that to get the better result for the victim, essentially. Now, I don't need to tell any of you that this is a truly horrific case. You've listened to it. It's absolutely grotesque. But I think at least it is reflected in the really harsh sentences imposed. Because if you look at the six defendants who are actually prosecuted here, they received a combined total of 134 years to life when you combine those. So it was taken incredibly seriously. Now, what's frustrating for me is that many of the other 20 or so individuals who were actually involved in the attack, they never have been identified. So there are a whole group of those individuals who basically have got away with this. And the thing for Jane is that imagine living in an area where you don't know if there is a perpetrator walking past you who was part of that horrific attack. You have to live with that every single day of your life. And it's really poor justice when you don't turn up these individuals responsible for this transformative experience. It doesn't surprise me at all that following that horrific ordeal, Jane was relocated to another area. It makes perfect sense. At the end of the day, she wants to wake up in the morning and think the streets that I'm walking down are safe and I'm never gonna bump into one of these monsters ever again. Now in 2011, she actually had a civil claim and that civil claim was settled. It was the West Contra Costa Unified School that she actually took to court and the district paid $4 million in compensation because there is a real lack of safeguarding, isn't there? I'm not blaming any specific party, but this happened on the unified school grounds. She should have been safe. People should have been scoping the area. This is a group of teenagers, they're young. Some people have got alcohol, this is very normal. So making sure that somebody was walking around to check out that nothing untoward was going on, that would have been a very helpful situation to play out, and it didn't. But even though she's been given $4 million in compensation, and that will, to some degree, 
give her opportunities to have the best care possible and the best medical care possible because my god she was really badly injured she still suffers with hip and shoulder pain she also has migraines and she also struggles with learning and memory problems so she's had future totally changed and she needs that money so that she can at least treat herself with care and not be concerned about things like owning a home and paying bills at least that is taken care of but it, i know within a heartbeat she would choose not to have that money and just to have the life that she owned before. Now, the community of Richmond and the whole nation were absolutely blindsided by what had happened. They couldn't believe that so many people could just watch and that literally not one of them would call the authorities. And that was for over two and a half hours, remember? So when you think about how this played out psychologically, it feels as if this group, this pack, who give a permission base to this escalation in violence are so able to essentially allow one another to act in this way that the amplification of their behavior is just rapid, absolutely rapid. They're all encouraging one another to take it further, to take it further. And each act that follows basically sanctions what had happened previously. So what that person did, well, I can up the ante. And it essentially opened the floodgates for even more extreme behavior. Now, in some cases, fueled by alcohol, anyone who might have had reservations might have been reassured by those around them tolerating and encouraging this behavior. And that's what we see in many pack experiences. That's what we see in stabbings, where gangs get involved. Everybody feels like because the person in front of them has done this, they can do that. And so we see the most heinous behavior being tolerated, amplified, and we see people losing their lives because of this. Now, those who stood and watched, they weren't just ambivalent to what was happening. You know, as observers that did nothing, they actually sanctioned it, they legitimized it. Now, this is a psychological phenomenon that I mentioned a little bit briefly before, known as a bystander effect. That means that when other people are present, people are less likely to actually respond and take positive action. So you have less individual responsibility to act. So when lots of people are doing nothing, doing nothing basically becomes the norm. Now in this case, in my opinion, there was also possibly a fear of being considered a snitch or not being seen as part of the group and being concerned about potential repercussions if they did act, although I give them absolutely no empathy for that. You're a coward, you're a coward. I have literally no time and space with people who go, oh, well, I saw it happening, but I didn't want to say A, B, or C. Well, you're part of it. You actually are a contributor to that situation. The people I really respect are those who stand up and get counted in situations where their courage is tested, where they know they might lose, and they do it for the right reasons in the right moment, and their protective mechanisms mean that they are so pro-social that our society can only really benefit from them. When you just stand and watch or film, you are a problem and you were a contributor to these kind of horrific experiences. The location, I suppose, psychologically, we could say also plays into this crime. You know, it can allow for a more extreme behavior. It's a locked area, it's in a dark location on school grounds. It's also incredible to just consider the absolute juxtaposition that there is this happy school dance going on on the same grounds that a girl is literally almost losing her life in the most treacherous of ways. And also, there were actually multiple members of staff there. There was also four police officers. So this is so ironic. This kind of heinous crime actually got carried out at all. Now, as in many legal jurisdictions, there's no legal obligation on any non-participating bystanders to actually get help for Jane. But I don't care about that. I don't care that legally, there's not necessarily always a legal obligation if you're just seeing something to actually go and get help. But my God, there is a moral one. Even if there isn't a legal one, we have a human emotional vocabulary where we know right from wrong. And just because you might not have to, doesn't mean you absolutely should not. And I think genuinely that knowing that people who can just watch and see somebody being almost murdered, sexually violated in the most heinous ways, don't have some kind of legal responsibility, I think that means that we need to change the law. Because maybe if you knew that if you witnessed or filmed somebody being treated in the most heinous of ways, you could find yourself in trouble seriously with the law. 
maybe that would be something that would create an urge in individuals to actually act. But we shouldn't have to have that kind of legality placed there in process. Because every single one of us should absolutely 100% know that when somebody is in dire need, it is our duty as a human, as a compassionate ally, as an individual who should wish for those people that we don't know to be treated in the same way that we would treat our own, with respect, with compassion, with understanding, with protection. And if we fall short of doing that, then that raises serious questions about who we are. And every single human being should be willing to look in the mirror and think I am the best version of me. I do the best I can for myself and also within my responsibility towards others. And those who viewed that situation, they all felt so short that they should question their own humanity and they should address the issues that clearly they have. I know this case has been a tough one, but also I think it's been so powerfully important to cover it because it just demonstrates the impact of pack reality and how that plays out in real time with real people in real life situations like this. I hope that Jane goes on to live a thriving, beautiful life. I hope she finds love and success. I hope that her family, in spite of their issues regarding falling apart to some degree with her parents divorcing, still have a unity and a connection that she absolutely deserves. I'm glad that she has the financial help, which will help her deal with some of the trauma should it raise its ugly head. And I hope to God that every single one of those individuals incarcerated lives every single day regretting their actions and wishing that they had been better human beings. I hope it haunts them what they did and it also haunts them that they won't be able to be free because of their actions on that night that were so immoral and inhuman. They genuinely don't even deserve to be categorised as human beings. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know if you've got a comment to make. Please get involved in the discussion. I really enjoy reading the comments. I will be back next time as ever. Our thoughts go out to Jane and her family, but wow, I genuinely think for the most part in this case, at least there was a sense of justice. At least there was a legacy with his victim where we know that she had what happened to her taken incredibly seriously and acted on. Take care guys. Remember, it's always on us to act like the hero, even when others fall by the wayside in such situations. Be that change in the world. We're all capable of it and it can literally save lives. See you again next time, be safe.